Welcome back to my channel. Today I thought we would do a fun physics lesson because something that drives me crazy is that I'm not sure if I've ever heard a paranormal investigator actually explain what an electric magnetic field is and what it does and why it does that. Now usually it's explained an EMF is said what ghosts are made up of, right? Like I'm sure you guys have heard that a hundred times. Of course I have as well. You can't give the long version explanation every single time Ghost Adventures is on or Ghost Hunters is on, but as paranormal investigators, we really should know what an EMF is and how we are detecting it exactly. As you guys know, I've been studying physics for a while on my own, so I finally feel confident enough to talk to you guys about EMFs and how they're made and why we're able to read them through things like K2 meters, EMF meters, or even tri-field meters. So EMF actually stands for electromagnetic frequency. Or an EMF meter is something that detects this said energy, right? Now they were first invented for electricians, contractors, or even plumbers that are looking for EMF leaks within a house when they're actually doing construction. Now an EMF is considered an actual universal natural element or energy that can be detected from the earth. It's an invisible current that you can't actually see with your eyes in the air. And the stronger the current is, the higher reading you're going to get on an EMF meter. Now what are the sources of an EMF, right? Electromagnetic field. So natural sources such as lightning storms or big rivers generate EMF fields. Electrical sources, so you can get them from the heating vent, you can get them from the refrigerator, you can get them from the microwave, you can even get them from your smartphone. When the energy flows through whatever electrical source or natural source you have, that is when you're going to get an EMF reading. This is why when they tell you to take a K2 meter or an EMF meter like a Mel meter, don't drag it across the floor, right? Because if there's wiring in the floors or the walls, it's going to give off some sort of an EMF reading. There's several kinds of EMF meters. You can go to a solo reading, which is a single access, tri access, and I think there's even like quad access, but that's getting into really expensive pieces of equipment that usually only people like plumbers, electricians, contractors are going to use those. The tri access will give you the best reading, the most accurate reading that you can get. So, a tri field meter is probably your best bet to use if you're trying to detect EMF fields. So the problem with a K2 meter is they tend to be very sensitive. So even if you have a cell phone around or even a watch, it could read off of that. So I actually don't like K2 meters at all when I'm using EMF readings or trying to conduct some sort of analog data collection because K2s just are a little bit too sketchy if you're wanting proper data collection. Now in physics, there is something called Faraday's, F-A-R-A-D-A-Y's law, and that's basically an induction law. Inside of an electromagnetic meter, there is a coil, whether it's a single axis or a tri-axis. This coil will give off some sort of a signal. Basically, it's like its own electromagnetic field. And in order for like a Mel meter to beep, have you ever heard the actual antenna function beep? It needs the other side of an invisible electromagnetic field to make the coil make noise or give you an actual reading on the induction of the Mel meter itself. 
it's basically a voltage that is between the two. It's basically where invisible energy from the electromagnetic field is talking with the coil inside of the EMF meter itself. And that is when you'll get the buzz noise or you'll actually get the reading that goes up or even in digital analog on the mel meter itself. Now, if you were wanting to physically measure EMFs to see if it was actually working, you could measure the velocity of liquid moving, creating an electromagnetic field using an EMF meter. As the flow changes in the persistency of the water, so whether the water is moving fast or slow, that's considered an electromagnetic field force or voltage. That is captured by the electrodes inside of the electromagnetic field meter. Now the interesting thing is with EMF fields, it's claimed they cannot conduct So the energy we're reading with EMF fields when we're actually in the field of paranormal is some sort of unidentified energy that hasn't been detected or determined by scientists. You could claim this as a paranormal investigator where it's some sort of plasma or what have other people called it, um, orbs or light activity that we've seen. Like when we've captured actual orbs going into an electromagnetic meter and the meter goes off, we've obviously detected that whatever energy or ball of light that is made up of, it has created and made some sort of a voltage conduct going through the electromagnetic field meter, but it's been undetected through science, we don't know what that mass ball of energy is actually made up of yet, but we do know that it is somehow detected in the electromagnetic meter. The laws in which you're basically using the coil to read the electromagnetic fields, this is considered the electromagnetic laws of induction. I bet you guys out there didn't even know you were using physics every single time you were going to investigate. You are creating electromagnetic conductivity, also known as electricity flow. But you've created something with invisible light or some sort of a mass, plasma, whatever you want to call it, which has created this ball of energy that is still undetected. You have created a part of physics or a piece of science that no one really knows of existence yet. This is why it is so, so important that when you're doing EMF readings with a mel meter or a tri-field meter, whatever you use, make sure you're getting it on film. Obviously don't use the camera to where it's so close to the EMF meter that it's gonna make it go off. It would even be better to have another investigator behind you watching you conduct this because if you can capture this ball of energy going into the EMF meter, you are still proving science wrong that there is still some sort of energy that has been undetected by science. But I can tell you and detect that we have detected it through a conductivity of the mel meter and its actual coil inside of the mel meter itself. We together as a community are creating a new kind of science. So one thing I do want you guys to remember, like Bobby Mackey's, there's that giant river that's behind it, right? Everyone's like, oh, the you know water is creating such a you know energy field, and that's what's giving all of this EMFs. Remember, water or H2O itself isn't actually conducting the EMF fields. It's the impurities in the water which are moving that are creating the EMF fields. So just let me give you the definition of Faraday's law. The law of electromagnetism that's predicting how a magnetic field will interact with an electrical current to produce an EMF field. This is also called a phenomenon, which is electromagnetic induction. The guy that actually invented this law, his name is Michael Faraday, F-A-R-A-D-A-Y, and he actually invented this law in 1831. He did many, many electromagnetic field experiments, and he has a ton of data that he's done with research with electromagnetic fields. Of course, he did not use paranormal investigations for EMF proof or for data collection, but he did prove the rate of change with EMF, EMFs within the magnetic flux. Another really cool thing about EMFs is Einstein actually was in on it as well, and he was trying to determine the movement of the actual conductor that's involved with detecting electromagnetic fields. I think everyone was obsessed with this on a physics science sort of side because 
even if you're detecting EMF fields between a meter and the actual conductor, which would be, you know, a river or, I mean, if you're using H2O or if you're using your cell phone or if you're using a microwave, the energy that's still being detected, whether it's paranormal or not, is still invisible energy. When an EMF meter reads it, even if it's a microwave or a fridge for that matter, you still will not see the energy that's being conducted. I think that this phenomena is what made everyone involved in understanding EMF so interesting, was its invisible energy. So the last thing I wanted to do was I wanted to see the different axis, A-X-I-S, of all of the different um, MEL meters or EMF meters that we use in paranormal. And I wanted to tell you guys you know, what the single access um, and the tri access, the best ones to use are. So the gauze meter is super old school if you guys have used one of those. Um, they measure little to no EMF levels, so the fluctuations are probably, um, they can be made by anything, possibly even movement with um, conducting energy in the air, so be really careful with gauze meters. K2 meters are not the best to be using either if you're wanting to get an accurate reading for data collection in paranormal. Mel meters are considered a Pro Access 1 gauze meter. They do have strong field measurement, so they are accurate to use because of the antenna function. So always make sure that you're investing a little bit more in the Mel meter with the antenna function. It will give you a better reading and obviously better if you're doing data collection for a location. There are tri-access gauze meters, so if you're going to invest in a gauze meter, make sure it's a three or tri-access. Milligauss meters, um, as long as they have the two high sensitive meters inside of the EMF meter, they are really good to use. They will give you a really accurate reading for the measurement of the EMF. And obviously the tri-field meter, one, two, three access, right, is the best for reading milligauss or EMF fields. So the best reading you're gonna get is from a tri-field meter because it is a three tri-access. What's the difference between a single axis and a tri-axis? When you're using a single axis meter, like a K2, that means it only has one sensor in it. Usually it's right down the center. If you're using a tri-axis, that means there's a center, this side, and this side, which means all three axis, you're getting a very accurate reading when you're doing electromagnetic field data collection. If you only have access to a single access meter, make sure when you're using it, you are reading very slowly when you're going through a location because it's going to take a second for that solo axis in the middle to get exactly where you need it to be to get some sort of reading on it. If you're running around really fast with a K2 meter, you could potentially be creating more energy with an electromagnetic invisible field and create it and make it go off by itself. There's a possibility even static electric energy, like if you're using static across like, I don't know, a bed in a hotel, if you're on, on the bed and you set the meter on the bed for a K2, you could potentially be creating electromagnetic fields yourself just, just with static electricity. So be very careful when you're using a solo access meter. So now when you're using a tri-access, you have three sensors in it, right? It's pretty darn accurate. It's gonna be really hard for you not to get a wrong reading if you're using a tri-access. So my suggestion to you would be to always be using a tri-access meter. There is no correct way to be using this since you have three sensors in it. If you're using it without any sort of electromagnetic field conductor around you, such as a cell phone or a microwave or any of the above, you should be getting a pretty darn accurate reading if it's a tri-access meter. Just take in mind, if you're using a tri-field meter or gonna purchase one, the tri-access meters are going to cost you a lot more. Those type of gauze meters are much better for data collection if you're wanting to be accurate. And that concludes today's weird science theater <laughs> regarding um, physics and really cool stuff. Make sure you're knowledgeable when you're dealing with this stuff because you're gonna get a lot of people that are into science that are non-believers, and there is a science behind this. We just haven't had the correct thesis and scientific method behind it to be able to 
prove its existence. And I truly believe that people haven't done that yet because they're afraid that we could potentially be also discrediting the entire paranormal community by, you know, proposing a really good thesis and a scientific method if it concludes to be incorrect or wrong through science. So we will keep working on this as a community and it's super cool. Just make sure you sound really smart about it. You guys can do it. Just keep learning. Make sure that you're using a tri-field meter or a three-axis if you're wanting accurate data collection. Make sure you give my video a thumbs up. Make sure you've subscribed to my channel if you haven't already. Make sure you guys follow me on social media and I will catch you guys next time.